Hi guys, welcome back to our channel. If you're new here, my name's Ashton, and along with my husband Jonathan and our son Jack, we're an American family living here in the Black Forest of Germany. Now, in today's video, I'm gonna be doing this a bit solo, but I wanted to talk to you about a topic that I think is personally extremely interesting. So as many of you are well aware, as countries have been grappling with both a global pandemic and the resulting economic hardship, governments have been in charge of trying to make decisions based on what's best for both lives and livelihoods, albeit in different approaches. And as an immigrant family living here in Germany, it's been extremely interesting, not only just to witness how Germany has been maneuvering through this complicated time, but also reflect on how our, our own home country of the United States has been dealing with these same problems back home. Yeah, so it sort of prompted us to kind of take a step back and look at the two governments from a socio-political perspective. So I was really interested when the OECD, or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, recently released new data on trust in government. Interestingly, on average, across OECD countries, only about half of people say that they trust their national government, which is really interesting because according to their study, trust has only slightly recovered from the 2008 financial crisis. So I thought now would be the perfect time to not only do a deep dive into understanding what it means to trust your government, but also talk about how that trust is linked to social, cultural, political, and economic institutions in both the United States and Germany, and how that trust has shaped the relationship between citizen and government. So let's go ahead and dive right in. All right, so I thought the natural best place to start with this video is to take a look at that OECD study, specifically their methods, results, and approach to measuring trust. The OECD defines trust in government as the share of people who report having confidence in their national government. So the graph that you see on the screen reflects the share of respondents answering yes, the other responses being no or don't know. To the survey question, in this country, do you have confidence in the national government? Now, it's important to note that in order to have a robust sample size, the researchers did not account for demographic differences, such as age, gender, or education. They are all pooled together. Also, they pooled together responses over an eight-year time period, specifically between 2010 and 2018, to improve the accuracy of the estimates. The sample is designed to be nationally representative of the population aged 15 and over. So when we take a look at these results, we can see that Swiss citizens reported having the highest trust in their government, with 84.6% of all residents surveyed answering yes. Germany falls in the upper quarter of all countries surveyed, with 65.4% of all residents surveyed answering yes. And my home country of the United States, well, we fall right in the middle, with 46.5% of residents surveyed answering yes. Now, my knee-jerk reaction to these results was that, I don't know, I wasn't necessarily really surprised. When I think of Switzerland, I think of a neutral country that hasn't been involved in a whole lot of wars and has a pretty high standard of living. So yeah, that would have probably been my first guess at the number one spot. Although it should be pointed out that technically speaking, the country with the longest stretch of peace in most recent history is actually Sweden. But yeah, you, you get my line of thought. Now, Germany's ranking for me after mostly Nordic countries, that, that doesn't necessarily surprise me per se. I think I am maybe a little bit more surprised at the United States rankings, but if I'm gonna be honest, this OECD study left a lot to be desired for me. It was just a simple yes or no survey question. I mean, I personally wanted to know why is Germany so high in comparison to the United States? Or why is the United States so low? What are these factors that influence trust in one's government? So as you can imagine, I kept digging. And the results, well, they're pretty surprising.
Okay, so after learning about the OECD study, I set out to see if there were any other reputable studies that were also interested in researching trust in government. Partially, this was because I wanted to see if there was anybody else out there that could corroborate the results of the OECD study. But again, I, I also wanted to see more information on how one from a researcher's perspective would measure trust in government. What are those dimensions that influence it increasing or decreasing? And for the American statistics, I was actually pretty happy to see that there has been a robust study conducted by the Pew Research Center. In fact, they've been collecting data on Americans' trust in government since 1958. And whereas the OECD study asked a simple yes or no question, the Pew study asked Americans to rank their trust in government. Back in the late 50s, this study was dubbed the National Election Study. And originally, Americans used to have a much higher trust in their government. In fact, about three quarters of Americans trusted the federal government to do the right thing, almost always, or most of the time. However, like most things in life, context is everything, and major geopolitical events have shaped how much or how little Americans trust their national government. Trust in government began eroding during the 1960s amid the escalation of the Vietnam War, and the decline continued in the 1970s with the Watergate scandal and worsening economic struggles. Confidence in government recovered in the mid-1980s before falling again in the mid-1990s. But as the economy grew in the late 1990s, so too did confidence in the government. Public trust reached a three-decade high shortly after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, but declined quickly thereafter. Since 2007, the share saying that they can trust the government always or most of the time has never surpassed 30%. Their study finds that currently about 36% of Democrats and Democrat-leaning independents, along with 9% of Republicans, reported saying that they did trust the government. So if we assume that these are roughly equal pools of people from a population standpoint, then we actually are pretty close to the 46% that was reported in the OECD study. Now, unsurprisingly, during the Trump administration, more Republicans than Democrats reported as trusting in their government. And since Biden's election, that statistic has flipped. But I think what I find more interesting too is that if we look at the longevity of this study, we see that over time, the trust in government in the United States has become more and more partisan. Since the 1970s, trust in government has been consistently higher among members of the party that controls the White House than among the opposition party. But there are interesting differences here between the two parties. Republicans have often been more reactive than Democrats to changes in political leadership, with Republicans expressing much lower levels of trust during Democratic presidencies, while Democrats' attitudes have tended to be somewhat more consistent, regardless of which party controls the White House. However, the GOP and Democratic shift in attitudes between the end of the Trump presidency and the early Biden presidency is roughly about the same magnitude. Now, here's the thing. I don't want to get political here, but I think that anybody who wasn't living under a rock during the Trump presidency, well, you probably also noticed that that was very polarizing to say the least. But it is interesting, and I'm not really quite sure how to interpret this data. Are Democrats just more skeptical overall? So regardless of whether or not a Democrat or a Republican is in power, they just tend to not have as much trust? And well, maybe. If you take a look at this graph, it does show that even in times of high trust, Democrats still don't trust as much as Republicans do when a Republican is in power. But on the other hand, could this data also be interpreted to say that Republicans are just a little more dramatic? After all, when a Democrat is in power, their low trust is lower than Democrats. But here's the thing, no matter which side of the political spectrum that you happen to fall under, when you look at the American government and its two-party system, we don't really have a conservative and a liberal party. We have a conservative and a slightly less conservative party, by German standards anyway. 
But yet, as an American, when I was living in the United States, it just simply felt like the rift between Republicans and Democrats was just this huge divide. So when we moved to Germany and learned more about the German political parties and the political processes, it was pretty eye-opening. Hey everyone, before we move forward in this video discussing trust in government, I wanted to let you know how we are able to pull off doing the research for this video as well as the other content on our channel. As you can imagine, when looking at systematic or institutional systems in both the United States and Germany, we have a lot of research to do because we wanna make sure that our content is not only correct and reliable, but also as current as possible. And to do this, we can't simply just rely on Google and English language resources in order to make our facts, well, factual. The further we dive into German taxes, regulations, and other facets of life in this country, we also have to pull from sources that are written or spoken in German. Which is why we have made a huge effort to improve our language skills with the help of Lingoda. Lingoda is an online language school that connects students across the world with native level teachers in live classes to learn a language. Currently, they offer classes to learn English, business English, Spanish, French, and German and Lingoda hosts one-on-one -on -one or group learning sessions on Zoom for a range of abilities from beginner to advanced. And their classes are available 24 seven and they're a highly immersive experience. But I think what has been the most helpful for me personally is that I've been able to build on all of the principal skills of language learning, such as listening, comprehension, reading, writing, and culture. So when I do the research for these videos, I'm not only able to pull from both English and German sources, but I'm also able to pick up on subtle things like sarcasm and innuendos. So if you really want to jumpstart your language learning journey, you need to check out the Lingoda Language Sprint Challenge. It's an intensive language challenge where you are challenged to take either 15 classes or 30 classes a month for two months. But here's the best part. If you attend all of the classes, you can get either 50% or 100% of your cash back. Seriously, you can basically get to learn a language for free. But because you enjoy our videos and follow along on our journeys, we actually have a pretty exclusive offer that we can share with you. Use the code BFF30 or use the link down in the description of this video to get 20 euros or $25 off of the deposit. So why not join us? Boost your language learning skills and get the results in a short period of time. Research shows that when people feel represented, they are more likely to value civic participation. And while there are many other parliamentary-run governments that happen to score lower on the government trust index by the OECD than the United States, I can't help but wonder if Germany's parliament and that specific style of government by representation with the many different parties also might play a role in affecting their higher overall trust in government. Consider this, in the last presidential election in 2020, 62% of the voting age population went to the ballot box in the United States. That's the highest since 1960 when overall trust in government was much, much higher. But that number from the United States, well, it still falls short of voter turnout here in Germany. In the last election in 2021 for the Bundestag, the voter turnout was 76.6%, which was a slight increase compared with the 2017 Bundestag election, which was 76.2. The largest group of voters, 80.2%, by the way, were those aged between 50 and 59 years. But the by far largest increase in voter turnout was recorded for 21 to 29 year olds, whose share rose by almost four percentage points. And that's super interesting because one of the things that I first noticed when I came to Germany was just how vocal Germans are about politics and protesting policies that they don't agree with. Now, I have been told in the comment section 
that Freiburg might be an outlier. We have the reputation of being a little bit of like a hippie city over here where people just happen to protest more frequently. But I'm 100% serious when I say that we have literally had a protest in Freiburg every single weekend for what feels like well over a year. Now, those are mostly due to general frustrations that are being felt by some people about how the government has been responding to the pandemic and the different vaccine mandates. And, you know, I I'm not really going to weigh in on something like that, but I will say that it has been super surprising as an American to see that protests in Freiburg, well, they're not just a couple of people who are standing in the town square. I'm talking thousands of people who are marching down the streets in Freiburg with police escorts. But even before the pandemic, we would see huge protests in our city where cyclists would shut down the B31 in order to protest for a more pedestrian friendly policy in the city. Huge rallies on the Alta Synagogue plots. And actually, I think just, just a month and a half or so ago, there was actually another protest that happened on the B31 where the protesters actually glued their hands to the pavement and they actually had to call in a specialist to unstick them. But this has been so interesting for me as a foreigner, because as an American specifically, despite the fact that our country was founded by rebels who rebelled against the largest global empire at the time by throwing a tea party in the Boston Harbor, fast forward to the 20th and 21st centuries, protesting in the United States kind of has this connotation of being un-American. And it doesn't really matter which side of the political spectrum you fall on or what you happen to be protesting. Criticizing America is often seen as not loving your country, or again, quite frankly, just being un-American. But by contrast, here in Germany, political activism and political discourse, it isn't just something that's taught in schools, but it's actually encouraged for youth. I mean, Fridays for future, anybody? But here's what I find most interesting about German protest culture. For historical reasons, the issue of peace is particularly firmly anchored in German protest culture. And you know, quite frankly, of all of the demonstrations that we've seen, which have been many living in Freiburg, well, while they are certainly passionate, they're also largely peaceful. And it gives us this sense that in Germany, by protesting, by raising one's voice, well, it's just exactly how you show your patriotism, by advocating for a better country and making your voice heard as a collective group of people. Now, if you're actually interested in learning more about German protest culture from an actual expert on German protest culture, I'm going to link down in the description to a book called Bewegte Gesellschaft, Deutsche Protestgeschichte seit 1945. It's by historian and protest researcher Philip Gessert from the University of Mannheim. In his book, he comprehensively discusses the history of protesting in Germany from the time of the occupation to June 17, 1953 in the GDR, 1968 and the new social movements, the guest worker strikes of the 1970s and the peace movements in East and West of the 1980s to the most recent anti-globalization, anti-migration movements, and the fight for environmental policies to combat global warming. His book emphasizes the central importance of protesting as a form of social conflict resolution, even when it pursues undemocratic goals. And again, if you're interested in reading more specifically from this book, I'll go ahead and put a link down in the description below. All right, so now, although the United States and Germany happen to approach it from different methods, they are both in fact democracies, where the government is run by publicly elected officials who can vote on their behalf. So I think it's only appropriate that for the final section of this video, I also consider one of the fundamental dimensions of trust in government. 
and that's trust in democracy itself. The word democracy comes from the Greek words demos, meaning people, and kratos, meaning power. So democracy can be thought of as power of the people. But what happens when not all people have that power? And the people who are in the positions of power, well, they don't actually represent the people. So consider this. For starters, you have to be 18 to vote in the US, but you can vote for the Bundestag or federal elections at the age of 16 in Germany. And while both Congress and the German Bundestag aren't exactly representative from a demographic standpoint, things are actually a little bit more equitable here in Germany. For example, according to calculations done in July of last year, the average age of members of the newest Bundestag will be 47.3 years old. In fact, 50 members are younger than 30, while another 143 are between the ages of 30 and 39 years old. The youngest members are Emilia Fester and Niklas Wegener, both of whom are 23 and represent the Greens in the Bundestag. By comparison, the average member of the House of Representatives in the United States is nearly 58, and that person is a spring chicken compared to the Senate, where the average member is nearly 64 years old. In fact, there are more members of Congress over the age of 75, members of the silent generation along with Joe Biden, the oldest president in history, than there are members under 40. But despite these figures, well, it doesn't make Germany immune to dissolving trust between citizens and the democratic process. In 2018, 69% of the respondents said that they felt democracy is the best form of government, and less than 10% disagreed with that statement. This finding, however, shows a drop in the support for democracy by seven percentage points in the course of just a single year, because in 2017, it was 76%. But what I find particularly interesting is because of Germany's past, particularly with the East-West divide, this trust in democracy also has a pretty strong geographical component. Now, again, overall, there is an overwhelming majority for the support of democracy in Germany. But acceptance of democracy as the best way to form a government and lead a country, well, those numbers are significantly lower in the former communist East German states. The state with the lowest level of acceptance is Brandenburg at 61%. The highest is Lower Saxony at 84%. Okay, now before I let you go, I have to share this next statistic because as an American, I found it extremely interesting. So as we discussed earlier with both the OECD data and the Pew Research study, Democrats are more likely to trust in government than their Republican counterparts. But that's with the federal government. Things change dramatically when you look at trust in the state governments. Now, I'm going to apologize because this map is quite old. The most recent data research I could find was from 2014, but I think it still says a lot and can be quite appropriate here. As you can see here, in a 2014 Gallup poll, residents in Republican-leaning states are more likely to trust their state governments. According to Gallup, in only six states do at least 70% of residents place either a great deal or fair amount of trust in their state government. That was North Dakota at the highest with 77%, followed by Wyoming, Utah, South Dakota, Nebraska, Texas, and Alaska. In Illinois, my home state is by far and away the worst ranking state in the survey. Only 28% of Illinois residents say that they had a great deal or fair amount of trust in the state government. Now, to be fair, Gallup did point out that trust in state government tends to be highest in states with a lower overall population density, which they felt contributed strongly to Republican-leaning states, specifically the ones that made the top seven, in having more trust in their state government. But I also found it to be super interesting, again, as an Illinoisan, that in 2014, when this Gallup poll was conducted, 
Yeah, I I'm not surprised that hardly any Illinoisans felt like they could trust her state government. After all, we were just coming fresh off the heels of not one, but two governors in a row, both Rod Blagojevich and George Ryan, who had gone to prison on corruption charges. All right, guys, so to wrap up this video, I wanted to end by, as always, asking you a question. How well do you feel that you can trust your own government no matter where you happen to live in the world? And what dimensions, what factors of that government or of the electoral process makes you feel that you have more or less trust in the decisions that are being made on the federal and state level on your behalf as a citizen? Please let us know down in the comment section below. I think this is going to spark a, well, pretty healthy and extremely interesting debate and I can't wait to hear from you. And as always, if you enjoyed what you saw today, please make sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from the Black Forest family, hit that subscribe button. So until next time, guys, cheers.